Hello everyone. For today's video, I thought I would show you my process of design, specifically logo design. I had a friend who had asked me to design her logo for a new company she's wanting to start. So she gave me some parameters like the name of the company and that she wanted to have a cardinal as part of the design somehow. So for this video, I'm just going to show you my process of trying out different options and seeing which one will work best. So I'm going to start here by launching my program that I use Affinity Designer. I started using this about six months ago on a full-time basis. I played around with it a little bit before then. But I like the fact that it is not software that I rent, but it's software that I have purchased and I own, and I don't have to worry about paying a monthly or yearly fee for it. I'm pretty proficient in it. There's a few things that I'm still learning. It takes a bit of time to be completely comfortable with a program like this, but um, I'm definitely getting there. I'm saying I'm probably about 80% there. So what I'm doing is choosing a sketch that I did earlier and I'm bringing it in to the artboard here. I'm going to shrink it down so that it's a little easier to work with. And this is just kind of a geometric version of a cardinal's head that I sketched out on paper. I usually always try to start with a pencil sketch or a sketch done on my iPad by hand. I think that it gives a more organic feel. Some of the slight imperfections that arise from doing it by hand actually lend to a better design, a more natural human design, as opposed to one that's made purely by typing in numbers and making everything exactly symmetrical. So, I'm just going to sketch around the outline here, just to kind of start capturing this shape digitally. It's not a perfect square, it's kind of a pointed rectangle, change the width of the line. I usually like to draw in a brighter color over top of a sketch, because usually a sketch is black or dark gray, and so I picked a bright color so I could differentiate it from the background. At this point in time, this is just very rough. I'm getting the geometry down. It's pretty simple. But even if it was something more complex, I usually start rough. And then I'll go back in and refine curves and angles and stuff like that. But for this, it's pretty straightforward. So now we're going to do the beak, and that is all that I need for the sketch, so we can turn that off. And that kind of looks cool, just right there, but um, we're going to continue to work with it now that I can start adding colors and adding more things that are in my head beyond just the sketch. I looked up a Google search of cardinals and 
pulled up all the images and just kind of did probably about 10 different pencil sketches, starting with the most realistic, kind of actually copying roughly the photographs that I was seeing. And it also helped to bring up multiple photos of the same type of bird. So you can kind of see the variations in what is considered to be a cardinal. So from there I simplified each sketch, kind of seeing how much I could take away from the drawing and still have it clearly read as a cardinal. And a lot of it is sketching something out, seeing what works, playing around with that, sketching a separate, different way of approaching it, seeing how that works. And then usually it's a com combination of the best ideas from each kind of exploratory sketch that you did. That's how I kind of arrived at this. I've given it a dark background so that it's a little easier on my eyes to work with. I usually prefer that to having just a stark white background. Once I really dial in the colors, I'll probably put it on a white background, but that'll be later on down the road once I've got approvals back and I know that I'm actually going to use this. So everything that I'm doing right now is very loose and preliminary. It's kind of the next step beyond doing the pencil sketch. Nothing is set in stone. Everything is still up in the air and could be changed, deleted. Either because I don't like it or I have thought, thought of a better way or because the client will see it and have their own ideas of what needs to be done. So that's what a lot of design is, just putting something out there and then constantly refining it, criticizing it, changing it, and then putting it out there for having someone else to criticize it, critique it, change it and figuring out how you maintain some sort of creative integrity in that process so that there is still something of your input and ideas. And sometimes there's not. Um, part of being a successful designer is knowing if you're working with some clients that it is best to cut your losses and move on to the next client. I usually don't keep those type of clients around very long who insist on basically designing it all of themselves. But I don't think I'll have this problem with this job. So now I'm playing around with the beak. How do I represent this as a beak and not just a kind of kite-shaped orange square? So, I'm playing around with a dividing line down the middle, seeing what that would look like. And I'm, there is a far simpler way to do this, but as I was saying, I'm still learning the capabilities of this program. So, this is a ridiculously complicated way to accomplish what I wanted to. But I'll remember that in a few minutes and change my way of creating this. Affinity Designer allows you to mask one object with another by simply dragging it underneath it and nesting it in the layers panel off to the right. So I kind of forgotten that for a second. As I change this, I'll start using that more and more because it's very powerful, handy, quick way of making masks 
and clipping one object into another. So now you'll notice that the, the black of this outline is a different black than the shape. And that is because the shape is called a rich black. And you'll see I'm looking at the CMYK values. And the line is just black with no cyan, no magenta, and no yellow. And so while technically it is black, it does not have the richness of having the other, col other colors mixed in with it. So what I did was I changed the black for the outline to be a rich black, which is 100% black and about 60-70% of cyan, magenta, and yellow. And it lays down as a much deeper black when it's actually printed. So now I'm going to fiddle around with this kind of clipped corner here, which is bugging me. And I'm not quite sure why it is clipped at the corner. I'm going to have to do some research on solving that particular problem. I'm sure it's just a setting somewhere. But this is part of that process of me learning the deep um, working to this program. But, so I decided not to focus on that, even though it bugs me a little bit. I'll wait until I get a more finalized version of this before I solve this type of problem. Because this may actually look very different by the time we get done with it. And there's no sense in me f focusing on those type of details right now. So I'm still not happy with this beak. And I thought of a better way to differentiate the two parts of the beak and also add a little bit of dimensionality to it. So I'm just going to take this triangle and I'm going to clip it inside. First I'm going to give it a little bit darker color. I'm going to zoom in to make sure that it is bisecting that shape right down the middle. Those two corners line up exactly. So now you'll see I'm going to drag this and nest it underneath of the other shape and it clips it perfectly. That takes about a three or four step process in Illustrator and reduces it to basically one. So now I've got my basic outline. I'm happy with the general look of this. So I want to start to play around with some of the dimensions and see if I can get some parallels of some points. There's a balance to strike between complete randomness and complete order. So a pencil sketch gives me the random element. Now I'm seeing just how much order I can bring to this shape without making it too sterile. So I'm lining up some points to be parallel with each other. And I'm now looking to see if I make this general shape of the head an actual true square, what will that look like? So I'm using this big orange square as kind of a template. I've made a copy of the red square so that I can change one. And if I don't like it, I can just go back to the first copy that I made. So I'm making the square blue to give myself some differentiation of color. Lining it up with one edge. Seeing what that looks like. I'm going to play around with the red square. Bring it closer to this blue square's dimensions. So lining it up with a corner that's hidden by the beak. 
And that way I can drag the other three corners that I have access to and bring them into alignment with the blue square. So dragging that out, dragging that out, and bringing that down and over. And as you can see, it kind of, at least in my opinion, it's not as pleasing visually. It's a little too chunky now, blocky, literally. So, nope. Returning to the original shape, that was not a avenue that we want to explore, even though now we know. And that's the other aspect of design, trying things out, seeing what they look like, following some hunches. Sometimes the hunches turn out brilliantly, and sometimes they are not what you expected. But now that I've answered that question, I can move on to other avenues of exploration. So I'm going to bring up this gray box completely. I'm happy with this cardinal head for the most part. This is going to be the state that it's in for now. I'm kind of saving it. I'm going to zoom in, I believe, here in just a little bit. Tweak it just a little more. I like the dimensionality of the beak. So I'm going to try something very similar with the side of the head here just to keep that red square from just being so monumentally red. So I'm going to save that red to the color palette, apply that red to the smaller triangle, and then I'm just going to darken that a little bit to give that a little bit more visual interest and then nest that inside of the larger red square and we are ready to go. Now I want to line up the edge of that red square with the edge of that black marking so that it forms a continuous line. So I'm just drawing this temporary line as a guide trying to get it to show up some how it nested it deep within the background. So it's still hidden behind everything. So I need to drag it up further in the layers palette. There we go. So lock the background. Move the line exactly where I want it. Using this line kind of like I would a ruler. Always zoom in. Make the line a different color so I can actually see it. And then bring the black marking in line with that. And then bring the red marking in line with it. And that helps your eye just see it as a continuous shape across the head of the cardinal. And then we're going to fix up some smaller little details here so that we have a smooth continuation of shape here as well. So like I said, I like this. I think it has a little bit of forward momentum through the beak, it kind of tends in that direction, draws your eye down and through the beak, so your eye tends to move to the right by looking at that. But it's subtle, which is nice. So now I'm going to move on to another aspect of this design. So I'm keeping the bird's head, but I'm just hiding that whole layer. I'm going to add another one. And this time around, we're going to explore some fonts. My friend had 
given me the name that she wants for this business. And part of that name is going to be the initials V, J, and S. They have a significance for her, so we are going to incorporate them. So the first thing to do is just get the actual letters into the program. Lock that background so it doesn't annoy us. And I always try to label all of my layers. I found that that saves a tremendous amount of time later on when I'm trying to select something and I have a lot of different layers. If they're all named just like one, two, three, four, it's completely useless. So I take the few seconds just to give everything a label. So now I have my three letters and obviously this is just a generic starting font. So I'm going to start scrolling. I have a general kind of idea in my head of what I want these to look like, but I'm also willing to explore some different options. You can see I have some pretty crazy fonts. All of them portray a different mood. Some of them are formal. Some of them are um, informal. Some of them are silly. Some of them are made for large paragraphs of text to be easy to read. And others are designed for headlines, small squares and sentences, and even individual letters of text that are made to get your attention. So as I find a font that I like, I make a copy of it, and then I move on. Try to get this where I can see it. You become familiar with the list of fonts that you have at your disposal over time. You're always adding to it, rarely taking away. Sometimes I'll go through and I'll take out fonts that either are dated or I haven't ever used. But for the most part, I just continually add to the list. But you kind of get familiar and know how different fonts work with each other and with the other letters inside of that font. And so there's a few times where I kind of pause, think about, do I want to use this font? Would this work? And try to make a preliminary decision as I go through. Because sometimes you're pleasantly surprised with how the combination of letters looks in a particular font. I think it is one of those subtle decisions that we don't often think about that the typeface that a word is presented in can kind of set the tone for a piece. If you're not careful, the font choice can actually work against you and is saying one thing when the other visuals in a logo or a design are saying something else. So, right now I'm looking for things that are kind of formal. Since these are initials, I wanted to have some sort of formal, initial-like look to them. I didn't want them to look handwritten. So, I have some of my favorite fonts. This is one of them, called Mrs. Eves. I always at least include it if there's any slight possibility that I might want to use it. So, this is an interesting font called Fit. And every letter in the font fills up as much of the space as possible and still be somewhat legible. And it comes in a ridiculously wide variety of sizes. So it's one of those very specialized fonts. To try to set large amounts of text, it would be unreadable. But for 
a letter or two or a sentence. It can really be neat. So that's this is a this is a script font that I know pretty well. So I'm thinking that I may be able to do something with it later. So I'm kind of putting it to the side, even though it looks very different from my other choices. And this is a very stable, kind of generic serif font. Kind of has a school textbook, like learning your letters look to it. It's a little more chunky than some of the other serif fonts. So it's not quite as delicate. So it can stand up to a lot more size variations than a more delicate font. So just continuing to go through here, thinking basically making thousands of choices in my head as I'm going through this. Maybe not thousands, maybe hundreds. Kind of extrapolating out how these letter forms would perform in various situations that I might be asking of them. So you'll see that I'm leaning towards the kind of formal serif fonts that you would expect from someone's initials, like embroidered on a shirt or put in a family crest or something like that. So that's kind of the look I'm going for. I don't want the super informal look, but at the same time, I don't want it to be completely predictable and boring. So giving myself plenty of options. This is something, possibility, so I'm playing around with this, but I don't think that's going to work for what I want. And these sans serif fonts just don't give me the look that I'm looking for. So, like I said, if I enjoyed getting to know this program, I have done some flyers and brochures. I think this is my first logo work from scratch inside of this program. I've touched up a few other logos that I've created in Illustrator, but it um, does a great job of opening up my old files and allowing me to continue to work on them so I don't have to recreate everything from scratch. They also have a photo editing program called Affinity Photo. And I also am teaching myself how to use that as well. And it's a pretty solid replacement for Photoshop. It allows you to edit raw files, transport them into a JPEG or a TIFF or the native Affinity Photo format, add layers, do touch up, do color correction, and then export in a wide variety of different formats. So I'm finding it pretty powerful as well. And I also have a beta version of a program called Publisher, which they are currently refining through the beta testing program. And that program will allow you to create multi-page documents like booklets and longer books and magazines and stuff like that. So once they get those three programs solidly in place, they're going to be adopted more and more, I think, by creative professionals who are fed up with renting their software from Adobe. As much as I love Adobe software, 
I've used Illustrator and Photoshop and Premiere and Audacity, and I still use them at work. I know them like the back of my hand, but at the same time, I'm being priced out of being able to use them as a design professional and not be constantly bled for money. So, not when there's options like this where I can pay once and use the money for my design jobs to actually support myself and not support Adobe. So, it's a shame. It's not necessarily a decision that I wanted to make, but I'm very happy to have options. So, enough of my soapbox, <laughs> but as a design professional, I think if you did any kind of Google search on the topic, you will see that there's plenty of people with very strong opinions about it. I think it's unfortunate that companies make decisions that are make probably good financial sense, but they don't necessarily make good sense for the people who use their products every day. So I don't fault Adobe for restructuring how they provide their programs. It's their company. They are allowed to do that. But that doesn't mean I have to fall in line and rent my software from them. So I'm glad I have options. I think Apple's kind of struggling with this as well. The success of the iPhone and the iPad, and the Apple Watch, and their more consumer-oriented products, which are awesome and great and necessary. But the temptation is then to ignore some of the smaller aspects of their company, primarily like the pro users which at one point in time were a significant portion of their revenue, but now in proportion they are not. But it's still important to provide the tools that we need. And I think Apple's recognizing that. We'll see where they go in the future. So now I'm down to kind of my last selections here for fonts. Coming down to the end of the alphabet. Pretty happy with the choices that I have. I think I have a lot to work with. So, most of these down here are not really what I'm looking for. But I go through it anyway, because like I said, sometimes you're surprised. So, this is going to be my slate of potential fonts. So we're going to move these off to the side. And leave center stage for each font in turn. So I kind of know what I want to do. I want to make this J really big. And I want to bring the V and the S in. Kind of like... Kind of like... A, I mean, the word, the phrase that comes to mind is a cattle brand. But that's not really what this is. But it's kind of an identity mark. Using the initials. So I'm trying to find the right proportion here between the large J and the smaller V and S. And this is going to kind of provide a template for the other fonts as well. So, 
just playing around. Seeing what works visually. Kind of happy with that. So now let's see how that same treatment works with a different font. I like the dimensions and the kind of the faceted cut angular style of this font. I think it's going to work well with the kind of angular versions of the cardinal that I did. And it has a slightly kind of vintage, rustic feel to it. Kind of something you might see in the 1800s from woodblock type. So, I've done that. I don't like that script version. I'm going to come back to it in a little bit, but it's not doing what I wanted it to do for this. So, looking to see that script font that I deleted for the initials, I'm going to use it for the actual words. Oh. No, I'm actually seeing what this word will look like in some of the other fonts. I'll come back to the script font in a little bit, I think. Getting ahead of myself. I recorded these videos off my computer yesterday, so... I'm trying to remember what I did. So now... I'm going to be testing out this word in some of the other fonts, since they will probably be paired together. And I'm a big proponent of not using a ton of different fonts. If you can accomplish your goal with one font, then it's far preferable to having four or five fonts. Sometimes using two fonts in conjunction with each other are really powerful. But, so here I'm trying out that script font, seeing what it looks like, seeing if it is worth trying to make those script initials work with each other. Using my favorite Mrs. Eve's font, I'm just going through and making multiple copies of this word timber so that I have a little bit more information to work with as I'm making my choices. Because what might look good as initials might not look so great as a word. I think mixing fonts works well in like a brochure or a flyer where you have the need for an attention-getting headline type font, and then you'll need a font that is easier to read in large sentences and paragraphs. So that's where it makes a lot of sense to have at least two different fonts that work in harmony with each other. But oftentimes you'll find a font that you can use as a headline and there's also a variation of it that you can use for paragraph as well. But for logos, you're not using large paragraphs of text. So if you have multiple fonts, there needs to be a very compelling reason why you would need to use multiple fonts. Because that just adds to the visual complexity. And if that's not working for you, and it's working against you. So, just going through, making multiple copies of these words. Now that I kind of have the general layout of the initials, I don't want to apply that to every single font if I'm not going to be happy with the way that the font looks on the word timber. So that's my next decision. 
So this is going to help me eliminate some things I can eliminate right away. Like that is way too thin and delicate. It's not going to hold up. So some of these fonts are very similar. So it comes down to a preference of what I think they're going to look like. And unfortunately, Mrs. Eves is out. Again, a little too delicate for logo work. We see at the very bottom, we have that nice, big, chunky um, slab serif font, which I know is going to hold up well. So we're making some tough decisions. So that's kind of down to these three, what is going to work best? One is a little thicker and bolder than the others, and that might help it survive the different things that it's going to have to be going through. Because the logo can be big, like on a banner, but it can also be very small, like on a letterhead or on an envelope or on a website. So it needs to be easily readable and identifiable at all these different sizes. So sometimes the more delicate fonts have to be handled very clearly, very carefully. So right now it's coming down to how this looks in the initials and how it looks using the word. So I'm going to See how this font looks. I think this is Georgia. How does this look if I convert it into this monogram format? So there's that one. And then there's that one. Bring these up together. And you can see that J is really kind of taking over that one on the right-hand side. The loop is just huge. It's not really giving me what I want. So let's see if this one is any better. Bringing them together. Okay. So now, let's zoom in and look at some of these details. That middle one is looking really kind of just very chunky. It's not as elegant. It doesn't have as much vertical height with that J as the other two do. So just making some fine tuning here, making sure that my assessment is as fair and close as I can. So don't like that middle one. We're down here to these two. One has a J that kind of curls around a little bit more than the other one. So I'm also going to play around with this one. This J looks more like a fish hook, which I don't necessarily like. I think it's, it's coming across a little bit too rustic. The other ones are a little bit more refined. And then I really like this slab serif because I know it's going to perform well. So trying to bring it up. So you can see I'm kind of bouncing back and forth between what this font is going to look like as a word and what it's going to look like as this monogram. And based on that, I can start to narrow this down from what that I have what nine eight or nine ten different fonts now I'm down to about five so 
Now I'm just looking at all of the different options going back and forth. Do I want to try to work with this script font? These are kind of the more funky, rustic look. And I'm going to try to see what this looks like without the little line shadow. Kind of liking it. It's looking a little spread out. So I'm going to play around with the letter spacing here. Unsuccessfully at first. This is part of me learning this program. <laughs> but eventually we get there. There we go. That's the one I wanted. So bringing those letters in a little tighter, making them look more as a unit. Oftentimes that, that helps with a logo as well. You start reading the word as an entire shape instead of made up of individual letters. So now I'm bouncing back to seeing how these all look together. I'm pretty happy with most of these choices. I could live with any of them at this point in time. Some of them perform better than others as the monogram. But the slab serif, I think, just looked a little too clean. Didn't have that really rustic view or elegant view that I'm looking for. So we're down to these, which I think is going to be good. Now the script font, I don't think I can make those work as a monogram. I think it's going to be too distracting. But I think we're good. This is going to provide us with some good options moving forward as we start to combine them with some other visual elements. It's going to give us a wide range of styles from rustic to refined. I'm trying to match them up correctly here. There we go. And again, I may not end up using any of these fonts. I may not end up using these letters in a monogram form like this, but for now, I'm getting my ideas down, exploring them, seeing if they're valid, seeing if they actually work. This one seems to be pretty fruitful. I can see a lot of ways in which these components could be used and these different fonts could be used. So. I don't want to limit my options too much at this point by deciding on one single font because I may go down a different path and I'll have these options open to me still. I won't have to recreate the work that I'm doing now. So now that I have these basic components down, this is pretty much the extent of everything that I had in my head prior to firing up this program. So now I'm going to start to explore some other ideas that I have in my head, but in a very rough format. So this section is going to be a lot of experimentation with playing around with the cardinal head as well as the text and the letters, seeing how they work in combination just kind of getting a feel for how they're going to play well with each other. So the first thing I want to do is see how this cardinal head interacts with different shapes. How does it look on a white background? How does it look with a circle? Because it's not 100% symmetrical, it does present a little bit of a challenge because when you put it up against a symmetrical shape like a circle or a square. It emphasizes its quote-unquote imperfections. So I'm trying to see what it would look like without the red, without the black line, with the black line. Circle's not really doing it for me. 
maybe an oval. I may try an oval eventually. I don't know. It actually makes the circle look kind of distorted. So if a circle isn't quite working, what about a square? So this has some potential. Kind of has an asymmetrical look to it. I think that line is maybe a little thick, but those are minor details. Right now we're just seeing how those shapes interact with each other. So that's not necessarily bad. I kind of like the vague star effect that this gives it. That has some potential. So I noticed a little imperfection here. Now that I've taken off the black outline, there we go. Fix that. So now is there a way to extend this into the letters and start to form kind of maybe a visual theme? So I'm going to take this big chunky font here. I think it really works well with the angular logo of the bird. I'm going to be, oh, I'm making these that rich black, dark, dark, rich black that everything else is so that it fits a little bit better. So if I use these squares kind of as a motif of two frames, I think that all the angles can actually counterbalance the more smooth curves of this other font. So a lot of this is the design process of testing dozens and dozens of small permutations that oftentimes can lead you in directions that you weren't expecting. So that's kind of neat. I'm going to explore another idea that it's a little different. Set up this separate artboard. So make this a little wider here. And since this company is going to be involved somehow with forests, trees, something like that, I'm not going to exactly sure. So I'm now kind of bringing some of my own ideas to this now that I've played around with the ideas that the client brought to me. Now I'm going to start to incorporate some of my own thoughts into this. and really start to play around with pure colors and shapes. Now that we have what is pretty obviously a cardinal, what if we reduce this down to only a section of it so it becomes much more abstract than purely representational? So I'm going to 
See what it's like if I just give you a peek. Something that's not immediately recognizable as a bird. But is more just colors, shapes. Yeah. It's okay. It's not. It's not really floating my boat or crumbling my cookie. So I'm gonna play around with it a little bit more. So what if we got away from the monogram aspect and just did a straight typing out the initials? That looks a little better. I don't think it really says what we want it to say. But at this point in time, there are no bad questions. There may be some bad answers to those questions. But you won't know until you do the time to explore. So while this is interesting, it's less interesting than the permutation that I have there on the right. Kind of comparing these two, is this something to be explored, pursued? What does this look like if we do it this way? So we'll keep that as a possibility. I don't love it, but it may provide an avenue to explore later on. So now we're going to try something completely different. We are going to work with the motif of trees. So I want to stay with the kind of angular look of the cardinal. I think it lends itself to very powerful, simple shapes that are easy to reproduce and easy to grasp. And rely on the subtlety of the interaction of the patterns instead of the complexity of like an actual drawing of a tree or an actual drawing of a bird. So a series of triangles that get progressively smaller as they go up, changing their dimensions just a little bit. Working with this square, I'm trying to make a decision here. I know that I want it to be darker on the right hand side. So part of this is me testing out how far I can push this aspect of the program. Can I mask this rectangle behind all those shapes? And I don't think it's allowing me to do that. I can mask them to one specific shape, but not to an entire group. And I always like to make copies of shapes as I work so that I don't have to recreate it from scratch if I mess it up too badly. So we're going to mask this inside of this top rectangle. When 
and I can locate which triangle is the top triangle, which I haven't done yet. I'm still trying to figure that out. Okay, there we go. I need to bring it to that one. Perfect. So now I'm making sure that all these shapes line up. Seeing what I think about. This green color, how they work together. I think it works pretty well for now. Like I said, I'll probably dial in the colors exactly, but at a much later stage down the road. Right now, these colors are just kind of general representations of what I want. So now we're alternating. Trying to make these look more like trees and less like a stack of arrows, which is the challenge right now. But I like the alternating kind of striped look of this. But it doesn't quite come off as a tree. So I'm going to play around a little bit more with these. Let me know in the comments if you want me to like narrate step by step like exactly what I'm doing or just be kind of general in my descriptions. I think trying to narrate step by step may be a little tedious. I'm not sure. So I may do more of these as I progress with this logo and some other projects. Oftentimes I don't want to reveal a project that a client is working on. It's kind of something I'm working on with them and I'm not always 100% comfortable with showing the work that I'm doing because the client may not want it to be released yet. So this one's a little different because it's a little bit more informal. I'm just doing it as a it's a favor to a good friend of mine, so I don't think she would mind being part of this video. But there's some other things that I do that I could probably show you. So let me know if you like this type of step-by-step, -step kind of very detailed design process as it's happening, instead of like just kind of talking about it in general, but seeing every excruciating little decision that is being made. So, so I, right now I'm trying some variations on these tree themes and these shapes and seeing how they interact with each other. And it's kind of losing the excitement it's just two triangles. So I'm going to try to do a drop shadow here and see if I can get some separation between these two shapes. That'll add some visual interest. Although I don't really like to use drop shadows in a logo because they are hard to reproduce easily. Specifically if like it's a one color logo. I'm trying to add a screen pattern that gives you a nice feathered drop shadow is not preferable. But I'm playing with it right now. Maybe looking like a little paper cutout look to it. So that's better instead of just a flat shape of two triangles stacked on top of each other. So anyway, as I was saying, let me know if you want to see more of these type of videos. Since I'm doing the work anyway, I just turn on my screen recorder and capture 
my process. And then you just come back and narrate it later. I think it would be too much trying to narrate it while I'm doing it. My brain is occupied with other things at the time, other decisions to be made. But now we're starting to get somewhere. Layering these three triangles on top of each other and kind of moving that shadow off to the right hand side instead of straight down the middle. I think that's something I could work with. So. And I think I'm getting a much better hang of how these shapes are nested inside of each other and using the clipping paths. Almost as a free form way of manipulating the shapes. And now I've introduced a third green color, which is really helping to define these as kind of three-dimensional shapes. And so I don't think I need quite as much drop shadow. I can really dial that back. So we're starting to see the lighter green is providing that classic kind of fir tree triangle shape. But then we have the medium green and the darker green that are providing the differentiation between the different layers. So now I'm seeing what it looks like without a drop shadow. And I think we can get rid of it, which makes me happy. I think it helps unify it now as a complete shape. And it's certainly looking more like a tree than my first attempt, so we can get rid of that. So now, since it's not just one tree, it's going to be a series of trees. I want to see how the edges of those trees interact with each other. Provide a few more triangles, a few more places of visual interest. See if we can suggest a forest through the trees. And then we're going to group those together, make a copy, put it behind, and then we're going to eliminate that last tree. So I think that gives a good indication of a prosperous forest that is not a Christmas look. I think that was the other thing I was trying to get away from was Christmas tree look. So now let's use that as a pattern. And we're going to frame it in a picture frame. I do have a tendency to like thick, chunky black lines. I think it helps Define space. It gets your attention without being overly dramatic. So now let's move these, make these trees a little bigger to fill up the whole space. So hopefully get some of those more pointy aspects of the trees. I 
I think that works pretty well. Again, this is an idea that was just kind of evolving as it went. So now I'm going to try to combine this with the cardinal. So we have the green and the red, which are nice complementary colors on the opposite ends of the color wheel. Those may work well together. And we're going to bring in the letters. I'm going to bring all these together. Several different layers of images. We'll see how this works if the, the monogram is the emphasis of the piece. I'm liking that a lot. I think that F definitely has potential. So we're going to save that. So now, taking that aspect of it, let's replace the trees with the cardinal going back to our kind of clipped geometric shapes. I'm going to put the bird inside of there. If it'll fit, we're going to ramp travels. There we go. Now we get rid of the trees. Whoops, we put it in the wrong one. This is where I should be labeling more clearly my layers. When I make a copy, it copies the name. And so it's still difficult for me to distinguish exactly what's going on. There we go. So increase this in size just to fill up that box with color. And then obviously we need to change this so we can actually see it. There we go. I think that's very dramatic. And we'll just line it up here so that little sliver of red is not so distracting. So it doesn't really read as a cardinal anymore, but it definitely has the cardinal colors incorporated into it, which may be enough. So bring that a little bit more into alignment. So now it's just abstract colors. Probably not a final solution, but at least it is a variation on a theme which will hopefully yield results later on. So as you can see, just kind of playing around with the ideas, not necessarily rejecting anything at this point, but continuing to keep my options open. And I can continue to record my progress on these. I'm I have quite a ways to go with it yet. So let me know what you think. Really enjoyed working with this process since it was kind of a last minute request. So I'm kind of approaching it with some spontaneity and just kind of see where I can go with it. So I hope you've enjoyed this. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to my channel. I'll see you guys later. Bye.